This is my daddy's station. I'm Pooh, classic radio like you always wished it could be. 101.1 FM, eager. 101.1 FM is owned and operated by the Independent Foundation Trust as a non-profit community service. This is the Voice of Freedom. Listening to the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network. William Cooper, and this is the Hour of the Time. Make sure you have pen and paper again ready with you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, because once again, we're going to be covering some uh, highly unusual information. But I want to tell you right off the bat, if you have a computer, there is nothing that I'm going to give you tonight that is not on our website. So, if you miss something, you can go to the website and you can get all of this stuff. Well, not quite all of it. Almost all of it. Let me, let me put it that way. So, uh, pay attention because, uh, this is one of those nights in your continuing education on the lost life.
do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. This according to the Thelemic order of the Golden Dawn. At the very top of their emblem, ladies and gentlemen, is the symbol of the rose. There is now established in the world a new order of the Golden Dawn. It is a magical, religious, scientific order dedicated to the teachings of Aleister Crowley. The principal function of the new order is to assist in the initiation of aspirants into the magical life of Thelema. It is a magical order of the new aeon, wherein men and women, by the essential aids of science and religion, can participate in the great work of Thelema. The new order of the Golden Dawn is called in the Latin tongue Novus Ordo Aurora Aurea. It is also called the Order of the Thelemic Golden Dawn. The Golden Dawn now embraces and upholds the law of Thelema and seeks to extend that law in the world to establish the new kingdom of Horus upon earth. The rising god of the new temple is Horus, the crowned and conquering child of the new Aeon, born from the past, Aeons of Isis and Osiris. The old temple has been transformed into a new temple for our Lord Horus to indwell, that the great work of the new Aeon may be accomplished in his name. Love is the law, love under will. Those of you who have been listening to this broadcast for quite some time will have no trouble interpreting what I just read. Those of you who have not, probably think it's just a bunch of mumbo-jumbo, but I can assure you that it has the utmost importance for your future well-being and the future freedom of your children and grandchildren. Aeon, as you know, means age in the Greek. So new aeon means new age. It is the magical order of the new age wherein men and women, by the essential aids of science and religion, meaning their religion, can participate in the great work of Thelema. And for all practical purposes, you could just leave off of Thelema, <laughs> because the great work is, after all, the great work. seeks to extend that law in the world to establish the new kingdom of Horus. Who is Horus? Horus, ladies and gentlemen, is the full body of initiates upon earth. The rising god of the new temple is Horus. Now, do you understand what that means? The rising god of the new temple is Horus, the full body of the adepts, the initiates of the secret orders the crowned and conquering, conquering child of the new aeon, meaning new age, born from the past aeons of Isis and Osiris, meaning that they have learned from the mistakes of the past and they intend to exert their influence and control over the world. They say the old temple has been transformed into a new temple for our Lord Horus to indwell. Now, if you understand what that means, it means that man is God. The Lord Horus, the full body of adepts, the only truly mature minds endowed to rule upon this earth. And that the great work, the accomplishment of the bringing in of the new totalitarian socialist order of the new age, may be accomplished in his name. Whose name? Horus's name. Who is Horus? Well, I said it three times. If you didn't catch it, I don't know how else to tell you, ladies and gentlemen. Most of you who have been living your life in fantasy and ignoring what's going on around you and thinking that all of this stuff is just a bunch of gobbledygook are in for the shock of your lives. In fact, I think that when all this comes down, I really believe this in my heart, Many of you will just simply lose your mind. You will wander about the streets in a daze, sort of a, a trance, not being able to comprehend what has happened or why or who brought it about. And why you have to bear such a terrible burden of suffering during the chaotic transition from the new
disintegration of the old society to the old implementation of the new world order. And it will happen exactly that way. Why did I put it in those terms, ladies and gentlemen? Because there truly is nothing new under the sun. I know that many of you believe that you know the story of Christopher Columbus. I think that uh, most of us, especially in the United States of America, in Spain, probably in the great maritime countries of Europe, such as Portugal and uh, England and Holland, have studied the life of Christopher Columbus at some point in our lives, and if not, we at least cursorily brushed over it in school. And the story is different depending upon where you hear it, but I can guarantee you the public or exoteric version of the story is not the true tale, ladies and gentlemen. And they hear a different story in Latin America and in the Caribbean Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico than they do in North America. And there is a different story told in Spain and in Portugal and in England that is told in the Americas. Which story is the correct story? And why is it important that we should know these things? And what does it have to do with the MGM Grand Hotel in Las Vegas? Which, ladies and gentlemen, from the air is a huge, gigantic green cross. With a huge head of a lion over the main entrance, diagonal to the crux of the cross. And the lion is looking directly at the pyramid of the Luxor Hotel. And the beam of light that nightly shines up into outer space, the brightest light upon the face of this earth. What is the connection? Is there a connection? Well, I can guarantee you there is. Oh yes, ladies and gentlemen, there is. But there's also a connection with Mikhail Gorbachev's foundation, which flies the flag with a green cross upon it and his Green Cross organization. Which, by the way, is busy. Busy as a hornet's nest trying to bring about the dissolution of nation states, religions, and the formation of world government. And they make no secret about it. Well, just what is this connection, ladies and gentlemen? And what has it got to do with Christopher Columbus? Well, let's Let's see if we can discover exactly where that link is, if we can. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> that the Knights Templar were not a church organization. They were founded on the Temple Mount by the King of Jerusalem. They were not recognized by the church until many years later when they rose to a position of extreme power and wealth. And it was all political, had nothing to do with the worship of Jesus Christ or Christianity, I can assure you. And they never, in their history, protected the pilgrims on their way to and from the Middle East. That is a myth. A complete myth, ladies and gentlemen. One of their goals was to rebuild the Temple of Solomon. But that is a metaphor for their true purpose, ladies and gentlemen, which had nothing to do with building a stone temple upon the mount in Jerusalem. It had to do with the perfection of humanity and the bringing about of a new race of men. So with that small 
a bit of knowledge to prepare you for what I'm going to give you now. I hope that you will be able to understand it. For years, we have been told the story of Christopher Columbus and the date of 1492, but with the title of a book, The Untold Story of Christopher Columbus, by George Grant, there is fuel for thought. And it agrees with everything that I have researched, ladies and gentlemen, and brought to you on the episodes of the Hour of the Time. James Wolfe lived a year on San Salvador Island in the Bahamas. He had to read the untold story. So in a nutshell, he wrote a few strings of what he learned. Seems as if Mr. George Grant in his book, The Last Crusader, sees the trip as a way to raise money to help fund another crusade. An hour before moonrise on October the 11th, Columbus saw, or thought he saw, a light in the darkness along the western horizon. He wrote, and I quote, like a little wax candle rising and falling, end quote. In his daily logbook entry for December the 26th, 1492, the Admiral wrote, quote, I hope to God that when I come back here from Castile, which I intend on doing, that I will find a barrel of gold for which these people I am leaving will have traded and that they will have found the gold mine and the spices, and in such quantities that within three years the sovereigns will prepare for and undertake the reconquest of the Holy Land. I have already petitioned your holinesses to see that all the profits of this my enterprise should be spent on the conquest of Jerusalem. And your highness smiled and said that the idea pleased them, and that even without the expedition they had the inclination to do it. In a letter to Isabella, he asserted, The argument I have for the restitution of the Temple Mount to the Holy Church is simple. I only hold fast to the Holy Scriptures and to the prophetic citations attributed to certain holy men who were carried along by divine wisdom. Remember with what little cost you undertook the reconquest of Granada, and with what great reward. Later, in a letter to Pope Alexander VI, he underscored the seriousness of his intentions. The enterprise must be undertaken in order to spend any profits therein for the redemption of the sepulchre and the temple mount unto the Holy Church. And two more times he wrote, I must repeat, for the execution of the enterprise to the Indies, neither reason nor mathematics nor cartography were of profit to me in the manner that the prophecies of Scripture were. This is what I have to report concerning the liberation of Jerusalem. Be glad. If there is any faith in us, the enterprise is bound for victory. At the time, I was motivated by the Scriptures to go to discover the Indies. I went to the royal court with the intention of entreating our sovereigns to specify revenues that they might accrue to be spent on the reconquest of Jerusalem. So this last crusader set sail for Jerusalem, and somewhere along the way, ladies and gentlemen, he discovered America. Sounds like a Knight Templar to me. But still the question was, he connected to the Templars? By Jant and Lay in their book, The Temple and the Lodge, write that in Portugal, the Templars were cleared by an inquiry and simply modified their name. I revealed this to you many, many years ago, becoming the Knights of Christ. Vasco da Gama was a knight of Christ. Prince Henry the Navigator was a grand master of the order. Ships of the Knights of Christ sailed under the Templars' familiar red pate cross. And it was under the same cross that Columbus's three caravels crossed the Atlantic to the New World. Columbus himself was married to the daughter of a former grand master of the order and had access to his father-in-law's charts and diaries. Stephen Howarth, in his book, The Knights Templar, feels that due to the Templar's secrecy and unknown events, fantastic notions and myths can neither be proved nor disproved. And of course, that is what they want you to believe. 
Thus, some people like to believe that the Templars found the Ark of the Covenant. Surviving Portuguese Templars were absorbed into a new royal military order. Christopher Columbus was a Templar. Brother John J. Robinson writes in his book, Dungeon, Fire, and Sword, in Portugal, King Dennis I took both men and properties of the Templars into a new secular order called the Militia of Jesus Christ, or more popularly, the Knights of Christ, responsible directly to the king. In 1319, the order received the papal blessing of John XXII, who recognized it as a revival of the Knights Templar. Its most famous Prince Henry the Navigator in Vasco da Gama. The Knights of Christ used the distinctive red cross pate worn by the Templars, the same cross that artists used to decorate the sails of Columbus's ships, the Nina the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. But, and this is cleverly omitted from the book, ladies and gentlemen, and from the book review, the flag Columbus planted on the beach when he landed for the first time in the New World was a white flag bearing a green cross. And all the while, the king and queen of Spain thought that he went there to claim that land for him and rightfully should have planted the flag of the royal house of Spain. But that is not at all what happened. The flag, ladies and gentlemen, the green cross upon a white field that Columbus planted in the New World to claim the New World for a secret order of the Knights Templar. And that is the truth. Have you ever, ladies and gentlemen, wondered where the origination of Friday the 13th actually occurred? Well, it occurred 
in France. And I'm going to tell you that story now. I've told it to you before. But you see, I always get these letters from people who say, I don't believe what you're saying, Bill Cooper. So, I will read you the research of someone else. Nancy J. Gill. And here's what she says. I recently checked out a book from the library called Off the Road, A Modern Day Walk Down the Pilgrim's Route into Spain. Copyright 1994, published by Simon & Schuster. The author, Jack Hitt, decided to sidestep an anticipated midlife crises by abandoning his safe, comfortable American life to follow the pilgrimage route to Santiago de Compostela, Spain, the putative final resting place of St. James the Apostle. Lasting two months or more, depending on the starting place, the walk traditionally winds up just before St. James' Feast Day, July 25th. Along the route of Europe's oldest form of packaged tour, he encountered a varied cast of characters and a host of legends, and one in particular caught my eye. And this is the story. The king of France at the turn of the 14th century was known as an uncommonly handsome man. He was called Philippe Libel, the Beautiful. Philip the Beautiful. An ironic epithet for a king of Gothic pitilessness because of the French king's constant financial problems, relations between Paris and Rome had degenerated into a ludicrous state of affairs. The beautiful had exhausted all the usual medieval methods for balancing the books. He had stolen all the property that he could. He had arrested all the Jews and taken their wealth. He had devalued his currency. So as a last resort, he tried to tax the church. But Pope Boniface VIII was a fat and dissolute pontiff. One contemporary described him as nothing but eyes and tongue in a holy, putrefying body. A devil! The beautiful himself openly referred to him as your fatuity. But Boniface knew the rules of the game as well. And this is the true story, ladies and gentlemen, of the beauty and the beast. <laughs> and the end of the story is the hopeful reunion between all of these warring factions, some beautiful, some ugly, but absolutely necessary to bring the world together into one. The beautiful himself openly referred to him as your fatuity. Can you imagine that? Calling the Pope such a name? In retaliation for France's new fiscal arrangements, the Pope issued a dictum forbidding the taxation of the clergy. And here you have a rock and a hard spot. So the beautiful closed French borders to the exportation of gold bullion, cutting off Rome's transalpine money supply. And to rub it in, he arrested the Bishop of Panier and charged him with blasphemy, sorcery, and fornication. <laughs> and you know what? At least some of it was probably true. So the Pope issued a bull condemning the arrest and revoked some of the beautiful's papal privileges. Well, Philippe Lebel burned his copy of the bull in public. <laughs> and folks, for those of you who don't understand all of this, a bull is not an animal with horns here. A bull issued by the Pope is an order, as a matter of fact, an edict, if you will. The Pope, in turn, delivered a stinging sermon filled with ominous warnings that the church was a creature with one head, not a monster with two. And the beautiful issued charges in absentia against the Pope himself, alleging blasphemy, sorcery, and sodomy. Fornication wasn't big enough for the Pope. It had to be sodomy. The Pope, in turn, excommunicated the beautiful. Now, that's a real serious thing in those days, folks. He compared the French 
to dogs and hinted that they lacked souls. His nuncios leaked a rumor that the pontiff might well excommunicate the entire country. Sound a little like your children at play in the backyard? The peasants were stirred by such threats, and the beautiful quickly grasped that revolution was a better future to them than excommunication, so he acted fast, dispatching an army to Anagni, where the Pope was staying. He placed the 86-year-old pontiff under house arrest. The locals, however, managed to save him, but a month later Boniface passed away. And some allege that he succumbed to shock at the outrage. Beautiful return to his economic problems. His wife died in 1305, and since he no longer would have to kiss a woman's lips, he applied for membership in the Knights Templar. The permanent knights of the Paris Temple may have suspected that his intentions were less than pious and did something almost unspeakable. They blackballed the king. Now, in case you don't know what that means, even today in the Masonic Lodge, when a member or when a, when a profane is proposed for membership by one of the order, all of the members are given two little balls, one white and one black. And a box is passed around amongst the membership. And folks, when the box is opened, if there is one black ball in the box, the candidate cannot be admitted for initiation into the order or into the lodge. So apparently, Philippe Lebel received at least one black ball in the box when the Templars passed the box around the membership. For they blackballed the king. Now you don't just blackball a king. The following year, the Grand Master of the Knights Templar, Jacques de Molay, returned to Europe from the Mediterranean in a show of luxury. He was accompanied by sixty knights in a baggage train of mules laden with gold and jewels. And around that time, the beautiful was more desperate than ever to solve his messy state finances. He tripled the price of everything in France overnight. An open rebellion broke out in the streets. Rioters threatened to kill him. He fled to the Parisian temple and begged the knights for protection. Oh, how humiliating. So in the fall of 1307, Philippe Lebel the beautiful, arranged a state action impressive even in these days of data highways and rapid deployment teams because this is something that is so difficult to pull off. On September 14th, he mass mailed a set of sealed orders to every bailiff, seneschal, deputy, and officer in his entire kingdom. The functionaries were forbidden under penalty of death to open the papers before Thursday night, October the 12th. The following Friday morning, October the 13th, alert to their secret instructions, armies of officials slipped out of their barracks. By sundown, nearly all the Knights Templar throughout France were in jails. One estimate puts the arrest at 2,000, another as high as 5,000. Only 20 actually escaped from France. The initial charges were vague, but they didn't sound good. A bitter thing, a lamentable thing, a horrible to think of and terrible to hear. A detestable crime they were accused of. An execrable evil, an abominable act a repulsive disgrace, a thing almost inhuman, indeed alien to all humanity, has, thanks to the reports of several trustworthy persons, reached our ear, smiting us grievously and causing us to tremble with the utmost horror. What followed was so foul, according to folklore, that Templar sympathizers cursed the day itself, condemning it as evil, Friday the 13th. 
whose reputation, ladies and gentlemen, has never recovered. And because of it, and because of the torture that followed, worked upon the Templars in their captivity, and the eventual burning at the stake of almost all of them, including their grandmaster, Jacques de Molay, the Templars who had fled France and all of the Templars who were residing or traveling or happened to find themselves in other countries at the time, went underground, moved into the various fraternal orders that existed at that time, and rose to the top and took them over. Some went to Scotland and fought with Robert the Bruce and were rewarded for their heroism, their valor, and their military help at a time when he needed it. At a time when their help actually gave Scotland the edge and they won their freedom from England and formed the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. The Templars have vowed, ladies and gentlemen, to strike back and destroy all the monarchies in the world, topple the kings and queens and princes from their thrones, to destroy the church, all existing religions as they put it, and shackle the mob. Why were they angry at the mob, ladies and gentlemen? Because the profane peasantry and the middle class flocked to the burnings of the Templars and cheered and jeered and threw things at them and made fun of them in their misery and their suffering. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the origin of Friday the 13th. It is also why some of the most terrible upheavals in the history of the world since then have occurred in October. You ever hear of the October Revolution? The October stock market crashes. Not one, not two, not three. <laughs> A whole bunch. And guess what's going to happen next month, folks? If you've ever been to Washington, D.C., or for that matter, Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas, where 
John F. Kennedy was assassinated, you probably did not notice the occult symbology that surrounded you in these places, nor would you have noticed it being a profane, uninitiated, being illiterate in the secret language of the Brotherhood, you would not have noticed the same exact symbols in the outer courtyard of the Vatican, which it is, ladies and gentlemen, a round temple of the sun, similar to Stonehenge, with an obelisk standing erect in the center, and there is always a reflecting pool. Usually somewhere around there will be a triangle of some sort or a pyramidal structure. There will always be columns. Recognize any of that, ladies and gentlemen? In case you don't know what an obelisk is, the Washington Monument is an obelisk. Pat Buchanan identified himself as a member of these secret orders last Christmas when he sent out as a Christmas card a picture of an obelisk with a red ribbon tied around its base, the two bows, or the two loops of the bow, signifying the testes. For the obelisk is really the symbol of the Thales of Osiris, the lost word, the lost light, the severed part, which Osiris was unable to find. Remember that the sun is the doctrine, Osiris, Isis, is the church, the moon, the full body of adepts, the initiates, the Illuminati, or the child Horus, all searching for the lost word, the generative force, if you will, the creative power of God that is within them. And if you've been to the Luxor Pyramid Hotel in Las Vegas, I'm sure that many of you went through the three different entertainment acts called the Search for the Obelisk and did not even realize that you were in a temple of initiation and that when you left in your subconscious, you were a Freemason, Master Mason as a matter of fact, at that point, but without portfolio and without conscious memory or knowledge of what had just happened to you. In Washington, D.C., you will see the symbology everywhere. And if you go into the rotunda of the Capitol building and look straight up, a, a thing that most people never do, you will see that the people who built Washington, D.C. were not Christians, not ever. And most of the founding fathers were not either. They were deists. They were members of the Jacobin Clubs. They were members of the Freemasonic Lodges. George Washington and Benjamin Franklin were masters of their lodges. Thomas Jefferson actually defended Adam Weishaupt when the Illuminati was criticized publicly, just in case you thought it was all a big joke. It wasn't a joke to Thomas Jefferson, who, by the way, wrote his own Bible. He literally tore up the King James Version of the Bible. Said it was disgusting. There could be no such God in this universe. And he wrote his own. Isn't it amazing how shocked you can be to learn that you have been taught lies over the years? And that even now that you're being given the truth, you will resist it and you will rave at me, <laughs> the messenger, because you don't want to hear it based upon sheer emotion alone, without even checking the facts, as you should do, as I admonish you to do, listen to everyone, read everything, believe absolutely nothing unless you can prove it in your own research. Go out and prove me wrong, and you will shortly find that I am right, if you do your research properly. Also in Washington, D.C. is a building called the Pentagon, which houses the Magi. For the senior ranks of the military, there is made up in that circle of men a secret order founded by George Washington 
called the Knights of the Golden Circle. Its first chapter was formed among the officers who had served with George Washington during the Revolutionary War. Most of them were also Freemasons. A Pentagon, ladies and gentlemen, is but a very thin disguise for a pentagram. That's right, for a pentagram. For a pentagon is made up of the lines drawn from the tips of the points of the pentagram or the five-pointed star to form a pentagram. Within every pentagon is a pentagram. Just in case you weren't aware of that. In the language of the initiates, the pentagram is also known as the star of light when it represents or symbolizes the regenerate man or initiate. The holy pentagram, or star of the Magi, according to Elphus Levi, the great initiate of France, was known to the French Gnostic school as the blazing star. The sign of the intellectual omnipotent autocracy or spiritually enlightened masters known amongst the adepts as the Magi. The star of the Magi is the Word made flesh, and according to the direction of its rays, this absolute symbol represents good or evil, order or disorder, the saving lamb of Ormond and St. John, or the accursed goat of Mendes. It symbolizes initiation or profanation. It is at once Lucifer or Vesper, the morning or evening star. It is Mary or Lilith, victory or death, light or darkness. When the pentagram elevates two of its points, it, like the reversed triangle, represents Satan or the goat of the mysteries. When it elevates the one point, it is that star of light representing the Savior, goodness, virtue, adoration, reverence. And by Savior, they do not mean Jesus the Christ. They mean the Christ within, the God in man, the intellect that will ultimately make man God. The pentagram is the figure of the human body with its four limbs and a single point representing the head. The human figure with the head downward naturally represents a demonic force, intellectual overturning, misuse of the intellect, disorder, and final insanity. In the magic of the Magi, the hidden science of the occultists, it is a veritable law of the three worlds. The pentagram is an absolute sign. Old as history, and more than history, exercises an incalculable influence over souls. The sign of the pentagram is also called the sign of the macrocosm, and represents what the Kabbalists call microprospos. A complete understanding of the pentagram offers man the key to the two worlds. It is the absolute in philosophy and science. The ancient Magi drew the sign of the pentagram on their doorsteps to protect them against evils and to seek the help of all that is good. The G, which ancient Freemasons placed in the center of the blazing star, signified gnosis and generation. It also symbolized the two sacred words, at the same time having reference to the grand architect or universal builder. All the mysteries of the Magi, all the symbols of the Gnosis, all the figures of occultism, all the Kabbalistic keys of prophecy are summed up, ladies and gentlemen, in the sign of the pentagram, which was pronounced by Paracelsus, the greatest and most potent of all signs. Those who paid little heed to the sign of the cross tremble at the sight of the star of the microcosm. And this was taken from the preface of Nidor Priestess of the Magi, our Blazing Star, by Dr. J.T. Bettiero, former Supreme Grand Preceptor of the Magi. How about that? 
I bet that made you stop and think, didn't it? If this is a Christian nation, why is there an obelisk representing the phalus of Osiris in Washington, D.C.? Why, when you stand in the rotunda of the Capitol building and look straight up at the inside of the dome, do you see a painting of George Washington riding in the chariot, being pulled by the horses across the heavens as Apollo, the god of the sun? And why is it that around this big painting of George Washington and the chariot of Apollo are pictured all the old gods of the Roman pantheon, Mercury, Zeus, all of them, ladies and gentlemen. And why is there a huge pentagon hiding in its structure the greatest occult power known to man, the pentagram? And why are the streets shaped by, like the compass and the square? and all of the other symbology that exists there. I think you'd better wake up, ladies and gentlemen, for there has always been a secret destiny of America, and it has never been what you have always seemed to think. America has always been headed and directed and guided by the hand of the Illuminati. It was formed for the purpose of giving the common man for the first time in the history of the world real freedom. And once that revolutionary effect reverberated around the world, it toppled the kings and queens and princes from their thrones exactly as it was designed to do. And now they are in the process of going about their business of taking that freedom back from the common man and cementing their ties that they have made in the power structure of all the nations of the world to dissolve all the existing religions, all existing nation-states, to shackle the mob and bring about their final victory, their utopian socialist world government, which they call the Golden Dawn the New World Order, the New Age. That moment of silence, ladies and gentlemen, is to let at least some of what you heard tonight sink in. For it had better sink in, and you had better wake up very quickly. For you've been had. We've all been had. By those whom we believed in and trusted, who never, ever, not once believed are trusted in us. And all the while have been about completing the great work, the grand experiment. They believe that the end justifies the means. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that they will not do to accomplish their end. including blowing up more federal buildings and more trade centers and burning and murdering more church members as they did in Waco, Texas. There is nothing that they will not do to accomplish their goal, including, ladies and gentlemen, preparing you with a string of propaganda that there are missing atomic bombs in the world, some as small as a suitcase. And once they have prepared you for the proper length of time, 
if they believe there is no other way to disarm the people of America and bring about the totalitarian state that they want, they will, and I tell you this, they will, and you can bet on it, you can take it to the bank, they will detonate an atomic bomb in an American city. Good night. And God bless each and every single one of you. And may God reach down in His big, endless bucket of mercy and save this republic and its people.